As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will, but a poor thousand crowns. And as thou sayest, charged my brother on his blessing to give me good education. And there begins my sadness. My brother, Jacques, he keeps at school and report speaks goldenly of his profit. As for my part, he keeps me rustically at home or, to speak, me, to speak more properly, stays me here at home unkept for his horses are bred better. Uh -huh. But I, his, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, as the which his animals on his dunghills are as much bound to him as I. And besides this, this nothing, he so plentifully gives me the something that nature gave me, his countenance seems to take from me. He lets me eat with his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam, that grieves me, and the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, Why? begins to mutiny against this servitude. I will no longer endure it, though yet I know no wise remedy how to avoid it. Oh, yonder comes my master, your brother. Go apart, Adam. You shall I... see how he will shake me up. Now, oh. oh, sir, what make you here? Nothing, sir. I am not taught to make anything. What mar you then, sir? Marry, sir, I'm helping you to mar that which God made, a poor unworthy brother of yours with idleness. <laughs> Marry, sir, be better employed and be naught a while. Should I tend to your hogs and eat husks with them? Know you where you are, sir? Aye, sir, very well, here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? Aye, better than he that I am before knows me. I know you are my eldest brother, and in the gentle condition of blood, you should so know me. I have as much of my father's blood in me as you. Albeit, I confess. <laughs> Your coming towards me brings me closer to his reverence. What? Why? Come, come, elder brother. You are too young in this. Look at me, villain. I am not a villain. I am the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois, and he is thrice a villain that says such a father begot villains. If you were not my brother, I would not take these hands from thy throat till this other one had pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Thou hast railed on thyself. For well, sweet masters, be patient. Let go of me, I say. I will not till I please. You shall hear me. My father charged you in his will to give me good education. Now you have tutored me like a peasant, hiding and obscuring from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, give me such exercises as may become a gentleman, or else give me the poor lottery that my father left me by testament with that I will go bar my fortunes. And what wilt thou do? Beg when that is spent. I will not long be troubled with you. I pray you, leave me. I will no further offend you than becomes me for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. Huh. Old dogs be my reward. Ah, <laughs> most true. I've lost my teeth in your service. God defend my old master. He would never have said such a word. Is it even so? Begin you grow upon me? Well, I will physic your rankness and give you no thousand crowns neither. Good morning to you, Urshan. Good, Monsieur Charles. Uh, what's the new news of the new court? News? There is no new news, sir, but the old news. The Duchess has been banished by her younger brother, the new Duke, and three or four loving lords have put themselves into voluntary exile with her, whose lands and revenues enrich the new Duke. Therefore, he gives them good leave to wander. And what of Rosalind, the Duke's niece? Be she banished with her mother? Oh, no. She is at the court, sir, and no less beloved of her uncle than his own daughter. And where will the old Duchess live? 
They say she's in the forest of Arden, and a many merry men with her, and there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. <laughs> and what of you, Charles? You wrestle before the Duke tomorrow? Marry, do I, sir. And I've come to acquaint you with the matter. I'm given, sir, secretly to understand that your younger brother Orlando had the disposition to come against me to try a fall. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit. And he that escapes me without some broken limb shall acquit him well. I have myself noticed my brother's purpose herein and have by underhand means labored to dissuade him from it. But he is resolute. I tell thee, Charles, he is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition, a villainous and secret villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. Yes. For I assure thee, and almost with tears I speak, there is not one so young and so villainous this day living. Oh, I am heartily glad I came hither to you, sir. If he come tomorrow, I will give him his payment. Farewell, good Charles. Good morrow to you, sir. Now will I stir this game, sir. I will see the end of him, for my soul hates nothing more than he. Poor Orlando, the primogeniture under bro. Charles the wrestler, what a dream has fallen for our liver scheme. All the world's a stage, and the stage is set for trouble. I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet my cousin, be merry. Dear Celia, I show more mirth than I am mistress of. Unless you can teach me to forget a banished mother, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Heron, I see thou lovest me not with the full weight that I love thee. If my auntie, thy banished mother, had banished thy uncle, the duke, my father, so thou hast, thou hast still been with me, I could have taught my love to take thy parent for mine. Well, I will forget the condition of my estate and rejoice in yours. You know my father hath no child but I, nor none is like to have. And truly, when he dies, thou shall be his heir. For what he has taken away from my mother perforce, I will render thee again in affection. By mine honour I will. And when I break that oath, then well, let me turn monster. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, my sweet Rose, my dear Rose, be merry. From henceforth I will cuss and devise sports. Let me see, what think you of falling in love? I prithee do, to make sport with all. <laughs> what shall be our sport then? Hmm. Let us sit and mock the good housewife fortune from her wheel, so that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed more equally. <laughs> I would we could do so, <laughs> for her benefits are mightily misplaced. Mm -hmm. The bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Tis true, <laughs> for though she makes fair, she scarce makes honest. And though she makes honest, she makes very ill favoured. <laughs> <laughs> You must come with me to your father. <gasps> Were you made the messenger? No, by my <laughs> honour, but I was bid to come for you. Where learned you that oath, fool? Yeah, of a certain knife that, a knight that swore by his honour that the mustard was good <laughs> and swore by his honour that the pancakes were naught. Now, I'll stand to it. The pancakes were good and the mustard was naught and yet was not the knight forsworn. How prove you that <sighs> in the great heap of your knowledge? Aye, marry. Now unmuzzle your wisdom. Stand you both forth now. Now. Stroke your chins and swear by your beards that I am a knave. <laughs> by our beards? If we had them, thou art. <laughs> by my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swear by that that is not, you are not forsworn. No more is this knight swearing by his honour, for he never had any. <laughs> or if he had, he'd sworn it away before ever he saw those pancakes or that mustard. Who is it thou meanest? Ugh, one that old Frederick, your father, loves. My father's love is enough to honour him. Enough. Speak no more of him. You'll be whipped for taxation one of these days. The more pity that fools may not speak wisely what wise men do foolishly. <sighs> Tis true. 
For since the little wit that fools have was silenced, the little foolery that wise men have makes for a great show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes Monsieur Le Beau. Oh, Le Beau. With his mouth full of news. <laughs> Bonjour, Monsieur Le Beau. What's the news? Fair princess, you've lost much good sport. Sport? Of what colour? What colour, madam? How shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. Or as the destinies decree. <laughs> well said. That was laid on with a trowel. <laughs> Nay, if I end up losing my rank, thou losest thy old smell. <laughs> You amaze me, ladies. I would have told you of good wrestling, which you've lost the taste of. Yet tell us the manner of the wrestling. I will tell you the beginning, and if it please your ladyships, you may see the end. <laughs> For the best is yet to do, and here where you stand, they're coming to perform it. There comes an old man and his three sons, three proper young men of excellent growth and presence. <laughs> The eldest of the three wrestled with Charles, the Duke's wrestler, that Charles in a moment threw and broke three of his ribs, that there was little hope of life in him. So he served the second, and so the third, yonder they lie, the poor old man, their father, making such pitiful dole over them that all the beholders take his part with weeping. Alas, shall we see this wrestling cousin? Mm. You must if you stay here, for here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are coming to perform it. Well, yonder sure they are coming. Ah! Let us stay now and see it. Ah! treated his own folly on his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Even he, madam. Oh, alas, he's too young, yet he looks successfully. <laughs> How now, cousin and daughter, have you come hither to see the wrestling? Aye, my liege, so please give us leave. Oh, you will find little pleasure in it, I can tell you. There are such odds in the man. In pity of the challenges, youth, I would fain dissuade him, yet he will not be answered. Speak to him, ladies. See if you can move him. Uh, call him Hitler, good Monsieur Le Beau. <laughs> Do so, I'll not be by. Monsieur the Challenger, the princess calls for you. <laughs> ah, I'll attend them with all respect and duty. <clears throat> Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? Oh, no, fair princess, he is the general challenger. I come but in as others do to try with him the, uh, the strength of my youth. <laughs> Young man, your spirits are too bold for your years. You have seen cruel proof of this man's strength. We pray you, for your own sake, embrace your own safety and, and give over this attempt. Do, young sir. Your reputations shall not therefore be misprized. We will make it our suit to the Duke that the wrestling might not go forward. I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts. Wherein I confess myself much guilty to deny so fair and excellent ladies anything. <laughs> but let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial, wherein, if I be foiled, there is one shamed who is never gracious, and if killed, one dead who's willing to be so. The little strength that I have, I would it were with you. And mine, to eke out hers. Fare you well, and pray heaven I be deceived in you. Oh. Young gallant that is so desirous to lay with his mother. Ready, sir? You shall try but one fall. No, no, no. I warrant your grace. You shall not entreat him to a second that have so mightily persuaded him from a You place. should make to mock me after. You should not have mocked me before. <laughs> Come your ways. Hercules be thy speed, young man.
I'm going straight up. Kill you. Oh, oh, Excellent, young man. Charles, come on. Come on, Charles. Finish him. Finish him. Son of Sir Roland Du Bois. I wouldst thou had been son to some man else. The world esteemed thy father honourable, yet I did find him still mine enemy. <laughs> thou hadst pleased me better with this deed, hadst thou descended from another house. But fare ye well, thou art a gallant youth. I wish thou had told me of another father. My father, cuz, would I do this? My mother loved Sir Roland as his soul, and all the world was of my mother's mind. Had I before known this young man his son, I would have given him tears into entreaties ere he should thus have ventured. Oh, gentle cousin, let us go thank him and, and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me at the heart. Sir, you have deserved well. If you do keep your promises in love but justly, as you have exceeded all promise, your mistress shall be happy. <laughs> Gentlemen, wear this for me, when out of suits with fortune. That could give more, but that a hand lacks means. <laughs> Will you go, cuz? Aye, uh, fare you well, fair gentleman. <laughs> Can I not say I thank you? Oh. My better parts are all thrown down, and that which up here stands is but a quintain. A mere lifeless block. Oh. He calls us back. My pride fell with my fortunes. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Oh. Sir, you've wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemies. <laughs> Will you go, cuz? Have with you. Fear you well. Oh, God! What passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? She urged conference, yet I cannot speak to her. Oh, poor Orlando. Thou art overthrown, or Charles, or... Something weaker masters thee. Good sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place, albeit you have deserved high commendation, true applause and love. Yet such is now the Duke's condition that he misconstrues all that you have done. The Duke is humorous, what he is indeed, more suits you to conceive than I to speak of. Oh, sir, I pray you tell me this. Which of the two that were here at the wrestling is daughter of the Duke? Oh, neither is daughter if we judge by manners, but yet indeed the smaller is his daughter, the other is child to the banished duchess, and here detained by her usurping uncle, to keep his daughter company. Their loves are dearer than the natural bonds of sisters, but sir, fare you well. Hereafter, in a better world than this, shall I desire more love and knowledge of you. I am much bound unto you, fare you well. And so must I from the smoke into the smother, from a tyrant duke, Unto a tyrant brother. But oh, heavenly Rosalind! Orlando, he has found the strength through Rosalind sat on the bench. Even though his life's a pitch, she's made his heart feel super rich. All the world's a stage, and the stage is set for love. Not a word? Not one to throw at a dog. <laughs> no, thy words are too precious to be cast away upon curs. Throw some of them at me. Come, name me with reasons. 
Then there were two cousins laid up, when one should be lamed with reasons and the other mad without any. But is all this for your mother? No, some of it is for my child's father. How full of briars is this working day world? <laughs> The arbored furs, cousin, thrown upon thee in holiday foolery. If we walk not in the trodden path, our very petticoats will catch them. I could shake them off my coat. These burrs are in my heart. Hem them away. I would try if I could cry him and have him. Well, come, come wrestle with thy affections. <gasps> they take the part of a better wrestler than myself. <sighs> Is it possible that on such a sudden you could fall into so strong a liking with Sir Roland's younger son? <laughs> Dearly, doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? <laughs> By this kind of truth, I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly. Yet I hate not Orlando. No, Faith, hate him not for my sake. Why should I not? Doth he not deserve well? Let me love him for that. And do you love him because I do? <laughs> Here comes the Duke. Oh, his eyes full of anger. Dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, uncle? You, cousin. Within these ten days, if that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech you, your grace. Let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. Never so much as in a thought unborn did I offend your highness. Oh, thus do all traitors. Let it suffice thee that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Oh, thou art thy mother's daughter, there's enough. So was I when your highness took her duchy. So was I when your highness banished her. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My mother was no traitor. Then, good my liege, mistake me not to think so much my poverty is treacherous. Dear sovereign, hear me speak. Ay, Celia, we stayed her for your sake. House had she with her mother ranged along? I did not then entreat to have her stay. It was for your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young that time to value her. But now I know her, and if she be a traitor, why then so am I. We still have slept together, rose in an instant, eat, learned, played together. And wheresoe'er we went, like Juno's swans, still we went coupled and inseparable. <laughs> She is too subtle for thee, and her smoothness, her very silence, and her patience speak to the people, and they pity her. You are a fool. She robs thee of thy name, and thou wilt show more bright and see more virtuous when she is gone. Then open not thy lips. Firm and irrevocable as the doom that I have placed upon her, she is banished. <laughs> Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. <laughs> Mistress, provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon mine honour and in the greatness of my word, you die. <laughs> Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change parents? I'll give thee mine. Oh, I charge thee, be thou not more grieved than I am. I have more cause. Hath not, cousin. Pray thee be cheerful. Knowest thou the Duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No, hath not. Rosalind lacks in the love which teaches thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be sundered? Shall we part, sweet girl? No. Let my father seek another heir. Therefore, devise with me how we may fly, whether to go and what to bear with us. For now, by this heaven at our sorrows pale, say what thou canst, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To the forest of Arden, to seek out your mother. What danger would it be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll dress myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch my face, the like you do, so we shall pass along and never stir assailants. Were it not better, because I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all points like a man? Well, what shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse a name than Jove's own page. 
Therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. <laughs> but what will you be called? Um, something that has a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena. <laughs> but cousin, what if we essayed to steal the clownish fool from your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? Oh, he'll go along all the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. Let's away. Gather our jewels and wealth together. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from the pursuit that will be made after my flight. <laughs> Now go we, in content to liberty, and not to banishment. <laughs> The Duke Jones brushed out on a bush, so her and Celia go bush. Rosalind will dress a man, they'll take touchstone, what a plan. All the world's a stage, and the stage is set in exile. <coughs> so, who's this? Oh, who what? Who My young master? Whoa. Oh. Oh, my gentle master. Oh, my sweet master. Oh, 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 you memory of old Sir Roland. What makes you here? Your praise has come too soon home before you. Well, what's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth. Come not within these doors. What? Shh. Come not within these doors. Within this roof lives the enemy of all your, all your graces. Hmm. Uh, your brother. Oh, no, 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 shh, 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 shh. no, 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 brother. Yet, yet the son, yet not the son. I would not call him son of him. I would have called his father. Hath heard your praises. And this night he means to burn the lodging wherein you used to lie. Oh, my Lord. Shh, and you within it. <laughs> and if he fail of that, if he fail of that, he will have other means to, to cut you off. I have overheard him and his practices. Oh, oh, this is no place. This house is but a butchery. Abhor it, fear it, do not enter it. Well, whither wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither, so you come not here. What? what wouldst thou have me go? Wouldst thou have me go, beg my food? And with a base and boisterous sort and force of thievish living on the common oh, road. Oh, I, I, oh, I, I have 500 crowns. <laughs> the 50 <laughs> iron I saved under your father. Oh. All this I give you. Let me be your servant. Oh. Huh? I may look old, but uh, I am strong and lusty. <laughs> 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 Let me go with you. I will do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. Oh, how well in the appears the constant service of the antique world. We're service, sweat for duty and not for mead. But come your ways. We'll go along together and when we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled low content. Master, go on and I will follow thee even to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. <laughs> Cannot be. Some villains of my court are in consent and sufferance in this. I cannot hear of any that did see her. The ladies, her attendants of her chamber, saw her a bed, and in the morning early they found the bed untreasured of their mistress. My lord, the runnish clown at whom so oft your grace was wont to laugh is also missing. Hesperia, the princess gentlewoman, confesses that she secretly overheard your daughter and her cousin much commend the parts and graces of the wrestler that did but lately foil the sinewy Charles. And she believes wherever they are gone, that youth is surely in their company. Send to his brother. Fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search or inquisition quail to bring again these foolish runaways.
Jupiter, how weary are my spirits. I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I could find in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and to cry like a woman. But I must comfort the weaker vessel, for doublet and hose ought to show itself courageous to petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Eliana. I pray you bear with me. I can go no further. For my part, I would rather bear with you than bear you. Well, this is the forest of Arden. Aye, now am I an Arden, more fool I. When I was at home, I was in a better place. But travellers must be content. Aye, be so good, Touchstone. For look you who comes here. A young man in an old and solemn talk. <coughs> well, you know, that will make us scorn you still. <laughs> Corrin. That thou knewest how I do love her. <laughs> I partly guess, for I have loved her while. <sighs> no, Corin, being old thou canst not guess. <sighs> Though in thy youth thou was as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I did think did never man love so. How many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? <laughs> Into a thousand that I have forgotten. <laughs> then thou didst never love so heartedly. For if thou remember not the slightest folly that love ever did make thee run into, thou hast not love. If thou hast not sat as I do now, wearing thy hearer and thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company, abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. Oh, Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. Alas, poor oh, shepherd, searching of thy wound, I have had by hard adventure found mine own. No, oh, no, mine. We that are true lovers run into strange capers. But as all is mortal in nature, all nature and love is mortal in folly. Thou speakest wiser than thou art weary of. Nay. I'll never be wearing mine own wit till I break my shins against it. Jove, Jove, the shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. Aye, and I mind, but it grows somewhat stale with me. I pray you, one of you question yon man to see if he will for gold give food. Holly, you clown! <laughs> <laughs> Who calls? You're better, small. sir. He's not my kinsman. Oh, I'll say be very wretched. Peace, I say. <clears throat> Good even to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir, and to you all. I pray thee, shepherd, if that love or gold could in this desert place buy entertainment, bring us to where we may rest ourselves and feed. For here is a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succour. <laughs> Fair sir, I, I pity her and wish for her sake more than for my own that my fortune could more relieve her. But... Uh, I am a shepherd to another man, and uh, I do not share these uh, fleeces that I graze. <laughs> My uh, master is of churlish disposition, and does not reek to find a path to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides, his cot, his flocks, and his bounds of food are for sale now, and at our sheep cot, uh, by reason of his absence, uh, there is nothing for you to feed on, uh, but so what? Uh, come see, uh, and uh, by my voice, most welcome you will be. What is he that shall buy the flock and pasture? <laughs> that young swain you saw standing here but a while, who cares for n buying nothing. Well, I pray thee, if it stand in honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it of us. And we will man thy wages. Oh. I like it here and could willingly waste my time in it. <laughs> well, assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Uh, go with me, and if you like upon report the soil, the profit, and this way of life, then I will your faithful feeder be and buy it with your gold right suddenly. <laughs> For towny kids, the bush show charm. So Roz and Celia buy a farm, and here they're safe, and here they'll keep a lifestyle block, new friends and sheep, and all the world's at peace. But the stage is set to turn. Since 
sir, sir, that cannot be. But that I were not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge, thou present. But look to it. Seek out thy brother, wheresoe'er he is, find him with candle, bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine, worth seizure, into our hands do we seize, till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that your highness knew my heartedness. I never loved my brother in my life. Ah, oh, oh, more villain thou. Well, push him out of doors. And let my officers of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expediently and turn him going. Phoebe! Just make him melancholy. I thank it. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More, I prithee more. Oh, my voice is ragging and my guitar's out of tune. I couldn't please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, more another stanzo. Call you them stanzos? Oh, whatever you wish. <laughs> Nay, I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. Will you sing? More at your request than to please me. Come, sing. And uh, you that will not, hold your tongues. Hmm? Hold my hand, brother, rest your head to mine. Rest my words, brother, we'll be home in time. All the love that binds us and we'll feel no pain when the us will live again. So as cover the while, the Duchess is going to come and eat beneath that tree. She's been all day to look at you. And I've been all this day to avoid her. I'll go sleep if I can. And if I cannot, I'll rail against all the firstborn of Egypt. <laughs> Jaquees is a drag, he's smelling collie is his bag. He loved the song, though did you see? He pooped a rainbow over me. All the world's a stage, and the stage is all about me. Oh, oh dear master, I could go no further. Oh, oh I die for food. Oh, here. Lay I down and measure out my grave. Oh, farewell, sweet master. How now, Adam? No greater heart in thee? <laughs> Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. Up again. Three, two, one. Come on. All right. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it to the, for food to thee, yeah? yeah? For my sake, be comfortable and hold death a while at the arm's end, right? I'll be with thee quickly, and if I bring thee not something to eat, well, I give thee leave to die. But if thou diest before I come, thou art a mockera of my labor, right? Well said, thou looks cheerly, and I'll be with thee presently. 
Yet, yet thou liest in the bleak air. Come, I'll bear thee to some shelter. And if there be anything living in this forest, you shall not die for lack of a dinner. Adam is fading. Adam's giving up on life. Orlando will save him. He's all like, oh, she'll be right, mate. on edge and the stage is wearing thin I think he'd be transformed into a beast for I can nowhere find him like a man my lady he's even now gone hence here was he merry hearing of a song well go seek him out tell him I would speak with him <sighs> He saves me my labour by his own approach. Oh, why, how now, monsieur? Hey. What a life is this that your poor friends must woo your company? <laughs> what? You look merrily. A fool, a fool. I'm as a fool in the forest. A motley fool. A miserable world as I do live by food. I'm as a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. What fool is this? Oh, worthy fool. One that hath been a courtier and says, no. If ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it. Huh? Mm. Oh, that I were a fool. I'm ambitious for a motley coat. Oh, thou shalt have one. <laughs> Invest me in my motley. Give me leave to speak my mind. And I will, through and through, cleanse the foul body of the infected world, if they will patiently receive my medicine. Oh. Forbear! <laughs> and eat no more! Why, I have eaten none yet. Nor shalt not, till necessity be served. Right, of what kind should this cock come of? Art thou emboldened, man, by thy distress? Or else a rude despiser of good manners, that when with civility thou seemest so empty. He touched my vein at first, but forbear I say, he dies that touches any of this fruit till I and my affairs are answered. Yeah, and you will not be answered with reason. I what would die. you have? I almost die for food and let oh. me hell it. Well, sit down and feed and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that everything was savage here, mm. and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But if you have ever looked on better days and know what it is to pity and be pitied, then, then let gentleness my strong enforcement be, and I'll blush and hide my sword. Oh. <laughs> True is it that we have seen better days and have with holy bell been knolled to church and sat at good men's feasts and wiped our eyes of sacred drops that pity hath engendered. Therefore sit you down in gentleness and, and ask upon command what we have that may you, to your wanting may be ministered. Then but for be your food a little while, whilst uh, like a fawn, I go and find my dough. Uh, there is an old poor man who hath after me taken many a weary step limped in pure love oh. till he be first sufficed oppressed with two weak evils age and hunger I will not touch well, a bit well, go and find him and we will nothing waste till you return I thank you and be blessed for your good comfort thou seest we are not all alone in this world <laughs> this wide and universal theatre has more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Now they have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Now at first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Mm -hmm. Then, then, the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace and with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. And then a lover, 
After that, the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard. Jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fur round belly with good cape on lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon. With spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish trouble, pipes and whistles in his sound. The last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Sit down, your venerable burden, and, and let him feed. I thank you most oh. for him. Oh, so had you need, I scarce can speak to thank you for myself. Oh, you are, you are welcome oh. here. Mm. The rest of your fortunes, mm. I will not ask you now. Music, come play. <laughs> out for blood everything is upside down for you everything is clear as mud so you run the run again Sheeps, Fred still live it. Ollie's on the trail, and Jake, we said that thing about a snail. All the world's a stage, and the stage is closed for about 15 minutes. Bars over there, toilets over there if you need it. Bugger off, we'll see you in 15. There my verse in witness of my love. And thou, thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above, thy huntress's name which my full life doth sway. Oh, Rosalind, let these trees be my books, and in their barks my thoughts are characters, so that every eye that in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run. Run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, and unexpressive she. <clears throat> so, so, Master Touchstone, how like you this uh, <laughs> shepherd's life? <laughs> Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it's a good life. But in respect that it's a shepherd's life, it's naught. In respect that it's solitary, I like it very well. 
but in respect that it's private. It's a very vile life. Now, in respect that it is in the fields, it pleaseth me well. But in respect that it's not in the court, it's tedious. As it is a spare life, look you, it fits my humour well. But as there's no more plenty in it, it goes much against my stomach. Is there any philosophy in these, shepherd? None. <laughs> but that I know, <clears throat> the more one sickens, the worse it easy is. And he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. <laughs> the property of water is to wet, fire to burn, and good grass makes for fat sheep. <laughs> and a great cause of the night is lack of the sun. <laughs> and he that hath learned no wit from nature nor art may complain of good breeding or comes of a very dull kindred. Ha! <laughs> Such a one is a natural philosopher. Was he ever in court? Uh, no. Ah, oh, then thou art damned. Uh, nay, I, I hope. Oh, truly thou art damned, like an ill-roasted egg all on one side. Oh, for not being in court, uh, your reason? If thou, if thou never wast a court, thou never sawest good manners. If thou never sawest good manners, thy manners must be wicked, and wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state, shepherd. Oh, thou hast too courtly a wit. I'll rest. Oh, but look, here comes young Master Ganymede, my young mistress's brother. From the east to yeah. western end, no jewel is like Rosalind, her worth being mounted on the wind. Through all the world there's Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind. <coughs> Let no face be kept in mind, but the fear of Rosalind. <laughs> I'll rhyme you so eight years together. Dinner, supper, sleeping hours accepted. Out full for a taste. If a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosalind! Wintered garments must be lined, so must slender. Rosalind! Those that reap must sheaf and bind, so to cart with. Rosalind! Rosalind! If the cat will after kind, so be sure will. Rosalind! Rosalind! Sweetest nut hath sourest rind, such a nut is. Rosalind! Rosalind! He that sweetest rose will find must find love's prick and... Rosalind! <laughs> this is the very false gallop of verses. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, you dull fool. I found them on a tree. Ha! Truly the tree yields bad fruit. Peace. Here comes my sister reading. Stand aside. <gasps> Why should this a desert be for some people? No, tongues I'll hang on every tree that shall civil saying show. <laughs> but upon the fairest boughs, or at every sentence end, will I, Rosalinda, write, teaching all that read to know the quintessence of every sprite heaven would in little show. Thus, Rosalind of many parts, by heavenly synod was devised of many faces, eyes and hearts, to have the touch's dearest prize. Heaven would that she these gifts should have, and I, to live and die, her slave. <laughs> <laughs> Most gentle Jupiter, what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners withal, and never cried, have oh, patience, good people. <laughs> How now? <laughs> Back, friends. Shepherd, go off a little. Go with him, Sarah. Come, Shepherd. Let's make an honourable retreat, not with bag and baggage, but with scrip and scribbage. Didst thou hear these verses? Yes, I heard them all, <laughs> and more too. For some of them had in them more feet than the verses would bear. Did, didst thou hear them without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of wonder before you came, for look here what I found on a palm tree. Know <gasps> you who hath done this? Is it a man? 
and who had a chain about his neck. Changes, change of color. I prithee who? <laughs> is it possible? I prithee now, with the most petitionary vim, it's tell you it is. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful, and yet again wonderful, and after that, out of all whooping. <laughs> Good my complexion. Dost thou think that though I am comparison like a man, that I have a doublet and hose in my disposition, one inch of delay more is a south sea of discovery. I prithee, take the cork out of thy mouth that I may drink thy tidings. So you may put a man in your belly. <laughs> is he of God's making? What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard? It is Orlando. <laughs> no, but the devil take mocking. Speak sad brow and true maid. No, in faith, cuz, tis he. Orlando. Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, today, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? Uh, what did he when thou saw he? What said he? How looked he? Where and went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? How parted he with thee? And when shall thou see him again? <laughs> Answer me in one word. <laughs> you must borrow me Gargantua's mouth first. But doth he know that I'm in this forest and in man's apparel? <sighs> Looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled? It is as easy to count atomies as it is to resolve the propositions of a lover. <laughs> but take a taste of my finding him and relish it in good observance. I found him under a tree, like a dropped acorn. <laughs> it may well be called Jove's tree if it drops forth such fruit. Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. There lay he, stretched along like a wounded knight. Though it be pity to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. Cry holler to thy tongue, I prithee. It converts unseasonably. He was furnished like a hunter. Oh. Ominous, he comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without burden. Thou bringest me out of tune. Do you not know I am woman? When I think, I must speak. Oh, you bring me out. Oh, comes he not here? Tis he. <laughs> Sink by and note him. I thank you for your company, but good faith, I had as lief had been myself alone. Oh, and so had I, and yet, for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. God be with you, let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be bitter strangers. Oh, I pray you, mar no more trees with writing love songs in their barks. I pray you, mar no more of my verses with reading them ill-favouredly. Rosalind is your love's name? Yes, just. I do not like her name. There was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. Ha! Ah. You have a nimble wit. Oh. I think twas made of Atlanta's heels. <laughs> will you sit down with me? And we two will rail against our mistress the world and all our misery. I will chide no breather in this world but myself against whom I know most faults. Well, the worst fault you have is to be in love. Tis a fault I would not change for your best virtue. <laughs> I am weary of you. By my troth, I was seeking for a fool when I found you. He is drowned in the brook. Look but in, you shall see him. Oh, there I shall see mine own figure. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. <laughs> I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell, good senor love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good miss, your melancholy. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey, and by that habit play the knave with him. <clears throat> Do you hear, Forrester? Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is it o'clock? Ah, you should have asked me what time of day. There is no clock in the forest. Well, there is no true lover in the forest, else sighing every minute or groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. Where dwell you, pretty youth? Here, in the skirts of the forest, with the shepherdess, my sister, like fringe on a petticoat. <laughs> and uh, are you native of this place? Your accent is something finer than you could purchase and so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many. Indeed, an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak. He was in his youth an inland man, one who knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman, to be touched with so many giddy offences that he has generally taxed their whole sex with all. And uh, what were the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? There were none principal. They were all like one another as halfpence are. Every one fault seeming monstrous until his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee recount some of them. No. They will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man, haunts the forest, that abuses our young plants by carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies upon brambles, all forsooth, deifying the name Rosalind. 
If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel. For he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am that he that is so love-shaped. I pray you, tell me your remedy. There are none of my uncle's marks upon you. I heard him read many lectures against it. He taught me to how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. But what were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. But a beard neglected, which you have not. I pardon you for that, for simply you having a beard is a younger brother's revenue. <clears throat> then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. You're no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Well, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it. Oh, well, that's which I warrant she I is apter to do than to confess she does. But, in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he. But are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves as well a dark horse and a whip as madmen do. Yet, I profess, curing it by counsel. Have you ever cured any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress. Right. Every day I would set him to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, would then like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, then weep for him, now spit at him. Then I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus, I cured him. And in this way will I take upon me to wash your liver clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my coat and woo me. Now. By my faith of love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it and I'll show it you. Okay. And by the way, you will show me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Well, you must call me Rosalind. Right. Come, sister, will you go? Rosalind has found a dude. The problem is she's also a dude. To woo her, he is. She has a plan. He'll woo her thinking she's a man. All the world's a stage. And the stage is gender fluid. do, but will have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? Well, as good as one would desire, therefore weep. His very hair is of a dissembling colour. Somewhat browner than Judas's, perhaps. Marry, his kisses are Judas's own children. <laughs> no, Faith. His hair is of a good colour. An excellent colour. Your chestnut was ever the only colour. <laughs> and his kisses are as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. Oh, I have bought a pair of cowslips of Diana. A nun of St. Winter's sister who kisses not more religiously. The very ice of chastity is in them. But why would he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly there is no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes, I, I think he is not a pick purse nor a horse dealer. But for his verity in love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in, but I think he is not in. You have heard him swear downright he was! Was is not is! <gasps> uh, um, oh, here, 
Thames, in the forest, on the Duchess, your mother. Yes, I met her just yesterday and had much question with her. She asked me of what parentage I was, so I told her, of as good as she. But what talk we of mothers when there is such a man as Orlando? Oh, well, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, makes brave oaths and breaks them bravely, quite traverse, athwart the heart of his lover. P.B. Who is it that comes here? P.B. 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 But say not so in bitterness. <laughs> the common executioner, whose heart, the accustomed sight of death, falls, the heart, makes, falls not the axe upon the humble neck, but first begs pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eyes. Tis pretty, sure, and very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things who shut thee coward gates on at me should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, oh, now let them kill thee. Well, now counterfeit to swoon. Why, now fall down. Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Death, baby. <sighs> if ever, as that ever may be near, you fall for some cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's oh, keen arrow makes. But till that time, come not thou near me. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother? That you insult, <laughs> exalt, and all at once over the wretched. What though you have no beauty? As by my faith, I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. Must you therefore be proud and pitiless? this? Why do you look upon me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. What's my little life? I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. So it's not your inky brow, your blonde silk hair, your bugle eyeball, nor your cheek of cream that can entail my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper a man than she a woman. To such fools as you that makes the world full of ill-favoured children. <laughs> but mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees and thank heaven, fasting, for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You're not for all markets. Oh, sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. And I'd rather hear you chide than this man woo. He's fallen in love with your foulness. And she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll source her with bitter words. Why do you look upon me? For no ill will I fear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me. For I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. <laughs> Come, sister, will you go? Shepherd, ply her hard. Shepherdess, look upon him better. Be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come, to our flock. Oh, dear shepherd, now I find thy sore of might. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe. <gasps> oh, what sayest thou, Sylvia? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do but sorrow at my grief and love, by giving love, your sorrow and my grief were both experiment. Oh, thou hast my love. Is not that neighbourly? I would have you. Oh, Silvius, the time was that I hated thee. And yet it is not that I bear thee love, 
But since it thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I will endure, and I'll employ thee too. Oh, but do not look for further recompense in thine own gladness that thou art employed. And now, knowest thou the youth that spoke to me a while? Oh, not very well, but I have met him oft, and he hath bought the land and cottage that the old Carlot once was master of. Oh, now, think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy, and yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Oh, yet words do well when he that speaks and pleases so is it here. Oh, it is a pretty youth. Not very pretty, but sure he's proud, and, and yet his pride becomes him. And he's not very tall, but for his years he's tall. And his leg is but so so, and yet tis well. <coughs> um. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And I had more cause to hate him than to love him. For what did he to do to chide it to me? I marvel at why I answered not again. But that's all one. Admittance is no quittance. I'll write him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? Baby, with all my heart. Oh, I'll write it straight. The matter's in my head and in my heart. I will be bitter with him in passing short. <laughs> Go with me, Silvius. Phoebe, she loves Ganymede, who doesn't have the bits she needs. Silvius has sealed his fate. Why was our Orlando late? All the world's a slave. And the stage is getting twisted. Come apace, gentle Audrey. I will fetch up your goods. Oh, Audrey. Ugh. What say you? Am I the man yet? Do my simple features content you? Your features? <laughs> Lord warrant us. Oh. What features? Ugh. I am here with thee and thy goats. As the most capricious poet, honest Ovid was among the Goths. Oh, knowledge ill inhabited, worse than Jove in a thatched house. <sighs> Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Oh. Is it honest in deed and word? No. Is it a true thing? No, truly, for the truest poetry is the most feigning, and lovers are given to poetry, and what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers they do feign. Would you not have me honest? No, truly, unless thou wert hard favoured. <laughs> For honesty coupled to beauty is to have honey a sauce to sugar. A material fool. Well, I am not fair, therefore I pray the God to make me honest. Truly, and to cast away honesty upon a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. <laughs> I am not a slut. Though I thank the gods, I am foul. Praise be the gods for thy foulness. Sluttishness may come hereafter. <laughs> <laughs> but, be it as it may be, I will marry thee. And to that end, I have been with Sir Oliver Martex, vicar of the next village, who hath promised to come and meet me here in this place of the forest and to couple us. I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. Amen! <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Here comes Sir Oliver Martins. Sir Oliver Martins! You are well met! Will you dispatch us here, under this tree? Or will we go with you to your chapel? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there none to give the woman? I will not take her on gift of any man. Uh, but truly, she must be given, or the marriage is not lawful. Ah, <laughs> proceed, proceed, I'll give her. Ah. ah, good monsieur, what you call it? How do you, sir? You are well met. Hmm. Will you be married, Motley? As the horse has his curb, the ox his bow, the falcon her bells, so man hath his desires desires. And will you, being a, a, a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you to church and have a good priest that can tell you what marriage is. I would rather be married of him than of another, for he is not like to marry me well, and not being well married will be a good excuse for me hereafter to leave my 
Why? Go there with me and let me counsel thee. Audrey! Ugh. We must be married or we must live in Baudry. Sir Oliver! Farewell, Sir Oliver. Not, oh, sweet Oliver, oh, brave Oliver, leave me not behind thee, but wind oh. away. Be gone, I say. I will not to wedding with thee. <laughs> oh. Nearly <laughs> a fantastical knave of them all shall flout me out of my calling. <laughs> Touchstone, he has met his match. And when shoes roof, he'd like to fetch. To church, he'll go to get the chance to get an Audrey's den and pants. All the world a stage, and the stage is full of weird love. Let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. <laughs> I am so. I do love it better than laughing. Those that are in the extremity of either are abominable fellows and betray themselves to every modern censor worse than drunkards. <laughs> Why, tis good to be sad and say nothing. <laughs> it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, and indeed, the sundry contemplation of my travels, wherein my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. A traveller? Yeah. By my faith, I fear you have good reason to be sad. You have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. <laughs> yes, I have gained my experience. And your experience makes you sad. I'd rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. There, then, God be with you if you talk in blank verse. Farewell, Monsieur Traveller. Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You a lover? And you serve me such another trick. Never come in my sight more. I, I come within the hour of my promise. Break an owl's promise in love. He that divides a minute into a thousand parts and breaks but a part of the thousand part of a minute in the affairs of love may be said of him that Cupid had clapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him heart whole. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy. Come no more in my sight. I had at least be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? Aye, of a snail. For though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. And what's that? Why, horns, and that which you were vain to be beholden to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. It may please him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of better leer than you. <laughs> but come, woo me, woo me. For now I am in a holiday humour and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now, and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you had better speak first, and when you are graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. How, if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to untreaty, and there begins new matter. Am I not your Rosalind? I take some pleasure to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Then, in her person I say I will not have you. Then, in my person I die. <laughs> no faith. Die by attorney. This poor world was almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time, there wasn't any man who died in his own person, Vidilicet, <laughs> in a love cause. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. <laughs> I would not have my Rosalind in this mind, for I fear her frown might kill me. By this hand, would not kill a fly. But come, now I will be your Rosalind in a more coming-on disposition. Oh. And ask me what you would. I will grant it. Then love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith will I, Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? I and twenty such. What sayest thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then, can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister, you will be the priest and marry us. Oh. Give me your hand, Orlando. Right. What do you say, sister? <laughs> I pray you, marry us. I cannot say the words. You must begin, will you, Orlando? <clears throat> Go to. <clears throat> will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. Why, but when? Why now, as fast as she can marry us. You must say, I take thee Rosalind for wife. I take thee Rosalind for wife. I might ask you for my commission, but 
I do take the Orlando for my husband. Oh, good. Now, tell me how long you would have her after you had possessed her. Forever and a day. Say a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the skies change when they are wives. I would be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cocked pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I would weep for nothing, like Diana in the fountain. Would do that when you are inclined to be merry. I would laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. Oh, for these two hours, dear Rosalind, I must leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack thee two hours. Oh, I must attend the Duchess for lunch, but I'll be with thee again by two o'clock. Go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as such, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. Mm. Tis but one cast away. And so, come death, two o'clock is your hour. Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth, break one jot of your promise and come one minute behind your hour and I will think you the most pathetical break promise and the most hollow lover and the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind ever to be chosen from the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore, beware my censure and keep your promise. With no less religion than if you were my Rosalind. Adieu. Adieu. You have simply <laughs> misused our sex in your love prayer. <laughs> We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head to show the world what the bird hath done to her own oh. nest. <laughs> oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, that thou dost know how many fathom deep I am in love. <laughs> but it cannot be sounded. My affection has an unknown bottom, like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather bottomless, that as fast as you pour affection in, it runs out. <laughs> well, I'll tell thee, Eliana, I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come. And I'll sleep. <laughs> Was that as weird for you as it were for me Seeing those who love so openly Do you think Orlando knows it's she Or does he love the she that's he All the world's a stage And the stage is about to get real How say you now? Is it not past two o'clock and hear much Orlando? Oh, I warrant you, with pure love and troubled brain, he hath taken his bows and arrows and gone forth to sleep. Oh, oh look who comes here. My Aaron, is to you, fair youth. Oh. My sweet, gentle baby, did bid me give you this. I know not the contents, but as I guess by the stern brow and waspish action which she did use as she was writing of it, it bears an angry tenor. Pardon me, I am but as a guiltless messenger. Patience once more would startle at this letter and play the swaggerer. Bear this, bear all. She says that I'm not fair, <laughs> that I lack manners. She says that I'm proud, that she could not love me were a man as rare as Phoenix. Oh, it's my will. Her love is not the hair that I do hunt. Why writes she so to me? Well, Shepherd, well, this is a letter of your own device. Uh, no, I protest, Phoebe did write it. Why, she defies me like Turk to Christian. Will you hear the letter? So please you, for I never heard it yet. Yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. She Phoebe's me, mark how the tyrant writes. Art thou God to Shepherd turned? that a maiden's heart hath burned. Can a woman rail thus? Call you this railing? Why thy god he had laid apart, warest thou with a woman's heart? Did you ever hear such railing? He that brings this love to thee, little knows this love in me, and by him seal up thy mind, whether that by youth and kind, or else the faithful offer take of me and all that I can make, and else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. Call you this chiding? Alas, poor shepherd, do you pity him? No, he deserves no pity. Wilt thou love such a woman? What, to make thee an instrument and play false strains upon thee? Not to be injured. Well, go your way to her, for I see love has made thee a tame snake. And say this to her, that 
If she love me, I charge her to love thee. She will not. I will not have her unless thou entreat for her. And if you be a true lover, hence, not a word, for well, here comes more company. Good morrow, fair ones. Pray you, if you know, where in the perilous of this forest stands a, a sheep coat fenced about by olive trees? West of this place, in the neighbour bottom, but at this hour the house doth keep itself. There's none within. If then an eye may profit by a tongue, then should I know you by description. Such clothes and such years are not you the owner of the house I did inquire for. It is no boast being asked to say we are. Orlando doth commend himself to you both. And to the shepherd youth he calls his Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame, if you will know me, what man I am, and how, and why, and where this handkerchief was stained. Well, I pray you, tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return within the hour. And pacing through the forest, chewing the fruit of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. He cast his eye aside and marked what object did present itself. Under an old oak, wretched, ragged man, overgrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. About his neck, a green and gilded snake had wreathed itself. His head, nimble in threats, approached the opening of his mouth. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unwreathed itself, and with indented glides it slipped away under a bush, under which bush's shade, a lioness with others all drawn dry, lay couching, with head on ground with cat-like watch when that the sleeping man should stir. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. I have heard him speak of such a brother and he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. And well he might, for well I know he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there, food to the sucked and hungry lioness? Twice he did turn his back in purpose so kindness nobler ever than revenge and nature stronger than just occasion made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him oh. in which hurtling from miserable slumber I awoke are you his brother was it you he rescued was it you that so oft contrived to kill him Twas I but tis not I I do not shame for what I was well, but for the bloody napkin. In brief, we sought our comfort with the gentle Duchess, who gave me fresh array and entertainment, and committed me unto my brother's love, who instantly led me to his cave, and there he stripped himself. And here, upon his arm, the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, and he fainted. And in fainting, cried out upon Rosalind. In brief, I, I recovered him. And after some small space, being strong at heart, he sent me hither, stranger as I am, that I may tell this tale and that you may excuse his broken promise. And to give this napkin, dyed in his blood, unto the shepherd youth that he in sport doth call his Rosalind. Oh. swoon when they do look on blood. <laughs> there is more in it. Um, uh, good sir, take him by the arm. I would I were at home. Oh, we'll lead you thither. <sighs> take good cheer, oh. youth. You a man? You lack a man's heart, eh? <laughs> so I do, but I confess it. A body would think this was well counterfeited. I pray you tell your brother how well I counterfeited. <laughs> hey ho! <laughs> <laughs> this was no counterfeit. There is too great a testimony in your complexion that it was a passion of earnest. Counterfeit, I assure you. Well, then take good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I do. But, I pray you, I should have been a woman by right. <laughs> <laughs> you look paler and paler. Pray you draw homewards. Sir, um, 
go with us? That I shall, <laughs> for I must answer back how you, how you excuse my brother. I Rosalind. will devise something, but I pray you commend my counterfeiting to him. <laughs> He's changed here in the wood, the country yeah has done him good. Orlando's paid the price and Oliver's now super nice. All the world's a stage and the stage was supposed to have a lion in it. But our budget didn't extend to that. We will find a time, Audrey. Patience, gentle Audrey. Faith, the priest was good enough for the old gentleman's saying. A most wicked Sir Oliver, Audrey, a most vile martyrs. But Audrey, there is a youth here in the forest lays claim to you. I know who it is, and he hath no interest to me in the world. Oh, here comes the man you speak of. It is meat and drink to me to see a clown. Good evening, Audrey. Good evening, William. And good evening to you, sir. Good evening, friend. How do you, friend? Oh, five and twenty, sir. Oh, a ripe age. What is thy name? Is it William? Aye, sir. Well, I am. A fair name. Was born in the forest here? Aye, sir. I thank God. I thank God. A fine answer. Uh, Rich? Faith, sir. So, so. Well, so, so is good. Very good. Very excellent. Good. And yet it is not. It is but so, so. Art wise? Aye, sir. I've got a pretty mind. Well, they say as well. <laughs> I do remember a saying. The fool I think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. You do love this maid? Oh, I do, sir. Give me your hand. Art learned? Oh, no, sir. Then learn this of me. Oh, <laughs> yeah! The drink being poured out of a cup into a glass by filling the one doth empty the other. For all your writers do consent that Ipse is he. Now you, sir, are not Ipse. For Oof. I am he! Oh, he, sir. <laughs> he that must marry this woman. Oh. Therefore, you, clown, abandon, which is in the common uh, league, the society, which is uh, in the vulgar, the, the company of this female, which is in the boorish woman. Therefore, you clown, abandon the society of this female or thou perishest. Uh, uh, or to thy better understanding, diest. Or to, or to wit, I kill thee. Make thee away. Translate thy life into death. <laughs> thy liberty into bondage. Oh, I will deal in poison with thee, or in bastinado, or in steel. I will bandy the infection. I will o'errun thee with policy. I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways. Therefore tremble and depart. Do good, William. God rest ye merry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Our master and mistress seek you. Come away. Trip away. Trip Come me. on. Are you tuned? Are you tuned? Oh. <laughs> Touchstone has a rival in the dude whose name is William. Audrey must have some good grace Cause you can't tell that from that face All the world's a stage And the stage must have hidden talents Is it possible that on so little acquaintance you should like her That but seeing 
love her and loving woo and wooing she should grant and will you persever to enjoy her? Need to call the giddiness of into question. Poverty of her, the small acquaintance, her sudden wooing, my sudden consenting. But say with me, I love Eliana. Say with her that she loves me. Consent with both that we may enjoy each other. It shall be to your good. For my father's house and all the revenues that were old Sir Roland's will I estate upon you. And here live and I a shepherd. You have my consent. Let the wedding be tomorrow. I will bid the Duchess and all her contented followers to come. Oh, but go you and prepare Ali Inna for look you. Here comes my Rosalind. Oh. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. Alas, dear love. How it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my arm. I thought my heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Oh, wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited to swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and greater wonders than that. Nay, it is true. For your brother and my sister no sooner met but they looked. No sooner looked but they loved. No sooner loved but they sighed. No sooner sighed than they asked one another the reason. No sooner knew the reason than they sought the remedy. They have, in these degrees, built a pair of stairs to marriage, oh, which they will climb incontinent, or else be incontinent before marriage. <laughs> they are in the very wrath of love, and they will together. The clubs cannot part them. <laughs> they shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the Duchess to the nuptials. Oh, how bitter it is to look into happiness in another man's eyes. And so, for that reason, I will be at the height of heart heaviness, knowing that my brother is happy having what he wishes for. Why then, tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind? No, I can live no longer by thinking. I will weary you then no longer with idle talk. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose. I know you're a man of good conceit. Believe then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have, since I was three year old, conversed with a magician, oh, profound in his art, and not yet damnable. Yeah. If you do love Rosalind so near the heart as your jester cries it out, when your brother marries Aliena, shall you marry her? I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible to me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, without any danger. Speakest thou in sober meanings? By my life, I do, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. Therefore, put you in your best array, and bid your friends, for if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, if you will, Baby. A lover of mine and a lover of hers. You, <laughs> you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter I writ to you. I cannot if I have. It is my study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you. <laughs> you were there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him, love him, he worships you. Oh, good shepherd. Tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and, and tears. And so I am for Phoebe. Again and, and I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be your maid of faith and service. And so am I for Phoebe. Oh, and I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be your maid of fantasy, your maid of passion, your maid of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? Why do you speak to? Why blame you me to love you? To she you? that is not here, nor doth not hear. I pray you, no more of this. Tis like the howling of the Irish wolves against the moon. I would help you if I could. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow, meet me all together. I would marry you if ever I marry woman. And I shall be married tomorrow. I would satisfy you if ever I satisfy man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I would content you, if what pleases you contents you, and you should be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. Fear you well, I lift your commands. I will not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. Rosalind has gone in me.
magical she claims to be A wedding for so many there May or may not happen here All the world's a stage And the stage is dressed in white Orlando, that the boy can do all of this that he hath promised. Well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, just as those who know they fear and fear they know. Patience once more, whilst our compact is urged. You say, if I bring in your Rosalind, you will bestow her on Orlando here. Well, that would I had a kingdoms to give with her. You say, you will have her when I bring her. Well, that would I, if I were of all kingdoms king. You say you will marry me, if I be willing. That will I, should I die the hour after. Or if you refuse to marry me, you will give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. So is the bargain. From hence I go, to make these doubts all even. I, I do remember something of the shepherd's boy, some lively touches of my daughter's favour. Oh, my lady, the first time I saw him, I thought he was a brother to your daughter. But, my lady, this boy is, is forest-born and hath been tutored in the rudiments of many desperate studies by his uncle, who he hath reported is a magician, obscured in the circle of the forest. <laughs> oh, there's sure another flood toward, and these couples are coming to the ark. Oh. Uh, here comes a pair of very strange beasts. There they are, which in all tongues are called fools. Greetings and salutations to you all! Oh. Good lady, bid him welcome. This is the motley-minded gentleman that I have so uh. often met in the forest. He hath been a courtier, he swears. Uh. Well, if any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. <laughs> I have trod a measure, I have flattered a lady, I have been politic with my friends, smooth with mine enemy. I have undone three tailors! I've had three quarrels and like to have fought a one. Good lady, like this fellow. Oh, I like him very well. Uh, <laughs> God bless you, ma'am, I desire you of the like. I press in here, ma'am, amongst the rest of the country copulatives to swear and to forswear according as marriage binds and blood breaks. A poor virgin, ma'am. Oh. Ill-favoured thing, oh, yeah. but mine own. There's a poor humour of mine, ma'am, to Want that that no man else will. Rich honesty dwells like a miser in a poor house. Or your pearl in your foul oyster. Oh. He's very swift and sententious. Mm. Is not this a rare fellow, Duchess? He's as good at anything and yet a fool. Ah, he uses his folly like a stalking horse and under the presentation of that he shoots his wit. Then is there mirth in heaven? When earthly things uh, can even made atone together? Duchess, receive thy daughter. Hymen from heaven brought her, yea, brought her hither, that thou mightst join her hand with his, whose heart within his bosom is. To you I give myself, for I am yours. If there be truth in sight, why then you are my daughter. <laughs> If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. Oh, if sight and shape be true, why then my love a Jew? <laughs> I'll have no mother, if you be not she. I'll have no husband, if you be not he. Nor near weird woman, if you be not she. Peace ho, I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here's eight that must take hands to join in Hymen's bands. If truth holds true contents, you and you, no cross shall part. You and you are heart in heart. You to his love must accord, or have a woman to your lord. 
you and you are sure together. As a winter to foul weather. <laughs> Whilst the wedlock hymn we sing, feed yourself with questioning. That reason wonder may diminish how thus we met and these things finish. Come, music, and you brides and bridegrooms all with measure heat and joy to the measures fall. We travel over lands, defeat the strongest man, derail the evil plans to keep us apart. But well, even as a lad, you made my heart so glad. This life, it ain't so bad With you as you are As you are As you will As you like my love As you do As you move As you like my
this life it ain't so bad if you as you are as you are as you will as you like my